Oh my, are you sleep deprived? A short night, it seemed like for many of us, I'm, I'm sure. You know, the phones change automatically, but the clocks in our house do not. I woke up at 1 thinking, is it 1 or is it 2? I woke up at 3 thinking, is it 3 or is it 4? I finally got up and looked at my phone and it was 4. <laughs> so it was a short night, but we're so glad that you're here today at Westside. Scott, thank you for leading us in those wonderful songs. And that last song you led, I know, was meaningful to you. And as well to uh, all of us here today. I want to congratulate Cy and Bonnie Tilton who will be celebrating their 53rd wedding anniversary on Wednesday of this week. And I'm sure uh, that all of us join together in saying, Bonnie, you're a mighty strong woman. We love Cy and we appreciate them so much, the work that they have done for so many years especially through the Ghana West African Mission work that uh, they are such an integral part of. So thank, thank you, Sai and Bonnie, and have a good anniversary. I have some friends, a husband and wife, who um, went out to eat a number of years ago, several years ago. They went out to a very nice restaurant the food was wonderful, the atmosphere was superb, and it made for a delightful dining experience. But when the waitress came with the check, he reached for his debit card, gave it to her, or his credit card, and she returned very quickly with the word that um, it had been denied. Well, immediately, he phoned his bank and found out that the card had been maxed out, was already up to its limit through purchases of electronics, toys, and clothing, none of which they had made. They were the victims of identity fraud. Now, this is not a commercial for LifeLock. Nor am I, nor is it a commercial for identity theft protection. But I found it interesting to read this past week that there were 14.4 million instances of identity fraud reported in 2019. 14.4 million. Incredible. But it's really not financial fraud that I want to talk about this morning. It's, it's not uh, uh, your physical identity theft that I really want to talk about. What I want to speak to you about this morning is the theft of your spiritual identity. Do you realize if you're a child of God, you have an adversary who is seeking with all of his might to steal your spiritual identity and to steal the identity of the church. The Bible never specifically says that Satan is a thief. There's no passage in the Bible that specifically says that Satan is a thief. Now, John 10, verse 10 is the passage where Jesus said, The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I've come that you may have life. But when you consider the broader context of the passage, I really think Jesus was talking there about the corrupt leadership of Israel as being those who had come to steal and kill and to destroy. But yet there's no doubt that Satan possesses many of the attributes of a thief. For instance, we know that uh, Satan is an accuser. Back in the Old Testament book of Zechariah, chapter 3, verse 1, we find Satan hurling accusations against the high priest of Israel. 
or Revelation 12, verse 10, where he is called the accuser of the brethren. We know that Satan is a tempter. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, he tempted Jesus during those 40 days in the wilderness. We know that Satan is the one who seeks to snatch the seed of the Word of God from our hearts, much as the birds seek to snatch the seed from the ground. Mark chapter 4, verse 15. John says, or Jesus says in John 8, verse 44, that Satan has been a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, for there is no truth in him. Whatever he says is a lie, and that is according to his nature, for he, is, he is, has been a liar and is the father of lies. Well, that's what Jesus has to say about Satan. Paul says that Satan is a schemer, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. We are to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And then in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Peter says, be sober, be vigilant, be alert, for your adversary, the devil, walks around or prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Martin Luther had this thing pegged right when he wrote in his majestic hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. His craft, speaking of Satan, his craft and power are great. And armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. So I want us to understand this morning that all of us are subject to being attacked by our adversary who is seeking to rob us of our identity in Christ and who is seeking to distort and undermine the identity of the church which Jesus bought with his own blood. Because of that, I feel it is extremely important to remind us this morning of three very essential truths. And the first of these is that all Christians belong to the church. All Christians belong to the church. That is our identity. We find our identity within the body of Christ. Your, your name, your identity, was given to you because of the family that you were either born into or perhaps adopted by or perhaps you married into. I have the last name Reeves. That's my family name. When my wife and I married almost 40 years ago this year, she took a new identity in terms of a name. She took my name. Dutch referred in his prayer to the wonderful wedding yesterday afternoon as Heidi Haddox has grown up among us here, entered this beautiful, uh, beautifully decorated uh, auditorium. She entered as Heidi Haddox, but when she left, she left as Heidi Reynolds. She had taken on a new name through her marriage. And when you become a Christian, you take on a new identity. You take on a new name that is intricately related to the church. In the New Testament, when people became Christians, there was a process that was involved. It was a process that involved hearing. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the rima the Word, the revealed Word of God. Everyone here today, and those watching by means of live stream on Facebook, everyone who is a Christian, you're a Christian because at some point in your life, you heard. You heard. Or you read. You in some way were made aware of the revealed Word of God. But not only is there hearing, there is faith. 
The Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he rewards those who diligently uh, seek him. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. There is the process of repentance. Jesus said, unless you repent, that is change your lives, a change of mind that leads to a change of action. Unless you repent, you shall likewise perish. He told a crowd in Luke 13, verses 3 and 5. And Peter said that God is willing that all should come to repentance. That's God's will. But not only repentance, there's the matter of confession. Jesus said, whoever confesses me before men, him shall I confess before my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 10, verse 32. And don't neglect the important role that baptism plays in the process of becoming a Christian. We're baptized into Christ, Paul writes in Galatians 3, verse 27. We're baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. Acts 2, verse 38, or in Acts 22, verse 16, where Paul was told by Ananias, Why do you tarry? Arise and be baptized. Washing away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. And in baptism, we're buried with Christ so that we may be raised up to walk with Him in newness of life. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. Now, what happens when a person becomes a Christian? What happens? Folks, here's where I'm going with this. When you become a Christian, watch what happens. Acts chapter 2, verse 47 says, those early Christians praising God and having favor with the people, and look at this, and the Lord added daily to the church those who were being saved. The church is comprised of all who are saved. All who are saved are in the church. Somebody says, well, I believe in Jesus, but I don't want to have anything to do with the church. Uh-uh, it doesn't work that way. That may be what you think, but that's not what God thinks. The church is comprised of all who are saved. You're not baptized into the church. Don't come to me and say, Brother Steve, I want to be baptized into the church. You're not baptized into the church. You're baptized into Jesus Christ. And Christ is the one who then adds you to his church. You're not voted into the church. It's not, the church belongs to Christ. He's not given man the authority to vote you in or vote you out. It's the Lord who adds us to the church. I heard about one guy, he uh, wanted to join this church and he lied on the application. So they vote him in. Well, sure enough, they voted him in and he felt guilty. So he told them, I'm sorry I lied. They voted him out. Let me tell you, that's foreign to the New Testament. When a person becomes a child of God, a Christian, it is the Lord himself who adds us to his church. Now, the second point I want you to understand is this. Notice this. There is an inseparable link between the church and Christ. An inseparable link between the church and Christ. There are many passages throughout the Scripture that talk to us about this, this inseparable nature between the church and Christ. For instance, over in the book of Acts, chapter 9, verse 4, you'll remember this occasion, I'm sure, when Paul, who then was known as Saul, this was prior to the name change, but Saul was on the road to Damascus for the purpose of persecuting Christians. And in Acts 9, verse 4, we find that as he neared the city, there was a bright light, and Saul fell to the ground, and a voice said, Saul, Saul, notice this. Why do you persecute who? Me. Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, who you persecute. Now, had Saul 
been there at the crucifixion. We have no record of it. Had Saul physically persecuted Jesus while Jesus uh, uh, had been alive here on earth? There's no record of it. What had Saul been doing? He had been persecuting the church. And yet notice what Jesus said. Why do you persecute me? There is an inseparable link between the church and between Jesus himself. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 13, Paul asked the Corinthians about their divisiveness, and he said, uh, this isn't a good thing. And he said, was Christ divided? Were you baptized into Paul? No. He's, he's talking about the link that exists between Christ and the church. Christ was not divided any more than the church should be divided. And then in, act, in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8, he, or excuse me, chapter 8, verse 12, I'll get it right in a moment. Chapter 8, verse 12, he says that when you sin against a member of the body of Christ, you sin against Christ. You see, we are the body of Christ. One heart, one spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. It's so important that we recognize it. Ephesians chapter 5 provides a very beautiful illustration of this. Beginning in verse 22 all the way through the end of Ephesians 5, Paul says that the relationship between the church and Christ is just like the relationship between what? Husband and wife. Now think about this. Men who are married, those of you who are married husbands, what if someone were to come up and start bad-mouthing your wife? What if someone were to come up and insult your wife? Or what if someone threatened your wife? I'll guarantee you there is not a husband in this room this morning worth his salt who would not take that personally. Raj, you'd take that personally, wouldn't you? If somebody came up and insulted Janice, I'd take that personally if somebody insulted Janice. But let me tell you, in the same way, my friends, when we speak ill of the church, we're speaking ill of Jesus. When we, when we neglect the church, we're neglecting Jesus. When we allow Satan to distort, to distort our identity as the body of Christ, we're allowing them to distort the very nature of Christ because there is an inseparable link between Jesus and His church. Oh, the world has so many ideas. You know, you hear people in the world say, well, you know, it really doesn't matter. Just do your own thing. doesn't matter. Let me tell you, the New Testament has a different idea. The Bible says it does matter. And the church has this inseparable link to Jesus himself. And because of that, number three, we are an extension of Christ into the world. You and I, the church, we are an extension of Jesus into the world today. In South Africa, there is a church building that has a statue of Jesus. Now, certainly not unusual. Many statues of Jesus in church buildings around the world, but this one is a, is a bit unusual. For this particular statue of Jesus has no hands. During the days of apartheid, a scuffle erupted in that church building and the statue was knocked over forwards and the hands were broken off. A sculptor was commissioned to repair the broken hands. The church members decided, we don't want the hands repaired. We want this statue to be a reminder to us that we, are the hands of Jesus today. 
You and I are the hands of Jesus. We're the feet of Jesus in the world today. We are the eyes of Jesus. Some years ago, when I was uh, preaching in Newport, Arkansas, just about 45 miles north of here, northeast of here, uh, and I love Newport, love that church so much. One night I received a call in the middle of the night from a young man, I guess he was probably in his late 20s, maybe 30, I had recently baptized him. He and I would go out jogging in the mornings. We'd gotten to be good friends. And he had been baptized. He called me during the middle of the night and he said, Can you come quickly? My wife has taken an overdose of pills. Got out of bed, I dressed quickly, drove just a few blocks to their house. He had already called and we were waiting for an ambulance and as we waited, he led me back down the hallway into the bedroom where his wife, his wife lay on the bed, dazed because of the drugs she had taken. He said, called her name and he said, Steve is here. I'll never forget what happened next. She lifted her head slightly and she said, Steve is here. He has the eyes of Jesus. I can't tell you how many times I've thought of those words in the last 30 plus years. And how many times I've asked myself, do I really? Do I see people the way that Jesus saw people? Do I see situations in the world the way that Jesus would see them? Do I see people who are struggling with sickness heartache and sorrow the way Jesus would see them? Do I really have the eyes of Jesus? And the fact is that all of us who are Christ followers are called to be the eyes of compassion upon the world. And when there is tragedy and sorrow such as the people of Tennessee have felt in the last week. And we have friends in the Cookville area, and I talked to Eric and Tracy just the other day, and they were, they were telling me about some of the people in their own church home there who have lost everything. Do we have eyes of compassion? And do we have feet that go about looking for opportunities to do good? as Jesus' feet did? And do we have hands that are willing when we see something that needs to be done to do it? Has Satan stolen our spiritual identity as believers of Christ, Christians, in members of his body, the church. I don't know how many of you have suffered identity theft, but all of us can do something about spiritual identity theft by making sure that we're in the right relationship with our Lord. If we can help you this morning, if you're not a Christian, follow the path.
that I outlined just a moment ago. Confess your faith in Christ. Turn away from sin. Be baptized into Christ. Everything's ready. We'd love to help you with that. And if as a Christian, Satan has somehow stolen your spiritual identity, my dear friend, will you come back to him today and let us help and pray with you while together we stay in the knowledge.